Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Chad Sievers, and I will be your webinar uh, moderator today. Um, so thank you for joining us um, for tips for conducting therapy via televideo with Dr. Melissa Zielinski. Um, and she'll be our presenter today. Um, go ahead and advance, advance to the next slide, please. So just a uh, few housekeeping announcements. Um, we encourage you to ask questions during the presentation, and there's a uh, question feature, which is on the right side of your screen. Um, also on the right side of your screen, we have a, uh, or a couple of handouts for you available to download. Um, so be sure to check those out. And if you're interested in earning a CEU, just stick around to the very end. We'll have a code that's given, and I'll give some more instructions at that point. Um, but we'll have a code um, that you'll need to receive your CEU. Um, we are recording this webinar, so um, if you'd like to revisit this at a later date, you can check us check us out on our YouTube channel. And um, if you're watching this at a later date, we only award CEs for attending live webinars. Um, and also, we, uh, our group, our best, we frequently um, post our trainings and information around childhood trauma, maltreatment, um, child traumatic stress uh, on our Facebook page. So you can check us out there if this is a uh, topic that is of interest to you. So I'm going to um, turn things over to Dr. Zielinski and let her introduce herself and get on with the presentation. Thank you, Chad. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Melissa Zielinski. Um, if we have not met before, I'm a clinical psychologist. Um, a lot of my job right now is I run clinically oriented um, grant research uh, that kind of sits at the intersection of health and the legal system. Um, and that's how I spend a lot of my time. Um, but I also continue to see some patients and have um, been doing teletherapy um, for about the past three years, and I'm excited to talk with you about this topic. Um, what I understand about folks that are on the call um, and all that you are probably trying to learn right now, um, this has been a steep learning curve, I think, for a lot of people having to rapidly transition to doing therapy, not in person in a clinic, but to doing it um, via some form of, of remote um, contact. So teletherapy, phone therapy, things like that. And people are juggling a lot more than just learning how to use you know, the, the modality well. Uh, a lot of people have kids at home right now with schools being out. Um, they're trying to you know, learn how to balance different responsibilities. Um, it's a lot to try to just kind of quickly transition. And I really hope that this presentation will be helpful to you in, um, in aiding in that transition. So just a little on um, my background as related to teletherapy. So how I ended up kind of hosting this topic, like I said, I've been doing teletherapy for about three years um, through a project that um, first start, kind of kicked off in 2016, where we've been delivering um, cognitive behavioral therapy and cognitive processing therapy, which is a, an adult trauma-focused therapy um, to folks with PTSD, bipolar disorder, and uh, major depression primarily. Although in this treatment trial, there's tons of comorbidity. Um, it's a, a practical trial, so there's not a lot of screening criteria. Um, and just kind of, I've really come to enjoy this topic of teletherapy because just kind of being honest at the beginning, I really did not like doing teletherapy. Um, I think I was wrestling with the same kinds of issues that a lot of folks have expressed that they're wrestling with now, just not liking it. <laughs> Um, not wanting to, to do it really. And for me, having a mindset shift, a major mindset shift has been incredibly helpful as well as kind of getting a chance to see it work well. And I'll talk with you today about just kind of tips and tricks um, as well as spend some, some major time on mindset because that's made all the difference. So um, a number of folks filled out a survey ahead of this presentation um, that I asked to just kind of get some information on what people are struggling with, dealing with, to help me prepare for kind of what to cover. And I just wanna actually put those results out very quickly to y'all because um, I think hopefully it will validate that if you're struggling right now with this modality, you're not alone. Um, you're in the right place with other people 
uh, that are kind of dealing with the same sorts of things. So um, the survey questions, there were three of them. The first one just kind of asked what concerns that you have um, about doing teletherapy. And I saw a ton around um, just feeling less able to keep clients engaged, uh, including examples of clients multitasking or doing other things during sessions. A lot of concern about building rapport and are you really gonna be able to do that via telehealth? Um, other concerns included not being able to fully see your clients the way that we can in person, which is totally, you know, part of, part of the deal with teletherapy. Um, there were also concerns around confidentiality and safety of children or teens kind of being able to talk openly at home. Um, and then, you know, practical concerns like lack of stable internet connection. And then some things that I think relate into mindset, um, feeling unable to manage technology failures, just feeling that teletherapy won't be effective. Um, so if you are feeling uh, frustrated or concerned, you are not alone. These were, you know, the big themes in there and there were a, a lot of people expressing that. Um, and so it's important to keep in mind that being able to do teletherapy really is a skill and it's one that gets better with practice. And a lot of these things will change with practice. I'll also address a lot of these things in the presentation today. In terms of biggest challenges, there were a lot of kind of uh, everything that was on the previous slide showing up in the answer to, to this question on the pre-survey as well. Um, and then there were also just like questions around basically how do I do what I'm normally able to do in the therapy room? Things like doing in-session exercises, using handouts, using whiteboards, being able to end session on time um, and or have clients engage for a full session and not kind of give up early on, a, on us. Um, and then some challenges around clients uh, flat out refusing either teletherapy or uh, like over phone or video. And then um, some concerns related to clients just acting differently than when in the office. And we'll talk um, about this stuff too. Uh, what did folks want to get out from, from the presentation and what I plan to cover today kind of I think is a good map onto this, basically how to be more effective, what are some tips and techniques that can help you do what you normally do, um, how to increase you know, your qualifications, how to promote engagement, and I got a lot of just anything <laughs> responses, kind of that feeling of this is all really new and anything would be helpful. Um, and I think I can, can definitely meet that. So what I'm gonna offer today is uh, some information on telehealth basics. I'll talk a little bit about my experiences and finding a mindset that really transformed my experience with teletherapy from a negative one to now really loving doing it um, and how you can kind of find a mindset like this too. I'll also give practical tips for how to maximize technology, including both uh, engagement with your clients and effectiveness with using the modality. Um, there'll be some notes about self-care and uh, time for discussion and problem solving. What I will not be able to cover, and there was a small number of requests around this, I'm sorry that I can't cover it. Um, I can't cover legal issues and policy. This is very different from licensing board to licensing board as well as between employers, so please consult with those parties um, to get, you know, the perspective on what's what's legal, what's going to be reimbursed, things like that. Um, I also, you know, gave the caveat when uh, agreeing to do this presentation, I do not do uh, therapy with children. So I can't give you a nuanced view on teletherapy with children. However, all of the information in this presentation really applies to kids as well. And um, I've spent some time talking to colleagues and reviewing some information and, and finding resources uh, that can help give you some more guidance um, specific to kids. But again, I think everything that I'm going to cover applies equally to adults and children. There are some good starter resources and trainings. Um, APA's Telepsychology Best Practice 101 series is a great resource. Um, I learned recently that it's actually down right now, but I suspect it will come back up at some time um, in the future. So just keep checking back on that. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and dive into the basics. Um, one thing I wanted to just show y'all, this is an article, this is a figure from an article that just came out um, that kind of summarizes the domains that are found in practice guidelines related to telepsychology practice. 
And I just thought it was a really nice visual illustration to, to try to set the stage for all of the different um, contexts in which teletherapy is um, starting to be applied, all of the different modalities that are kind of covered in telepsychology practice there on kind of the top surface of the cube. Um, everything from apps to email to text to uh, video conferencing. And then these practice domains on the front end of the cube where the authors of this article kind of coded what are in practice guidelines. Uh, this is an article that uh, was one of the handouts sent out um, for this webinar. So take a peek at that, it'll direct you um, if you are one of the folks that wanted more background on practice guidelines and kind of policy um, to information about that. Where I'm going to focus this webinar is primarily on video conferencing or kind of web-based um, telepsychology practice. But know that there's considerable diversity in what's covered um, under telepsychology practice guidelines. So um, in terms of the basics of what you need, and um, really most everything on here is pretty non-negotiable, um, to be able to do teletherapy well, you need stable internet access wherever you are. Um, you're gonna need audio and video enabled device with a microphone if you're doing um, televideo. Some people are doing phone, so video can be optional just depending on the situation. Um, but you're gonna need a device that has the ability um, for people to see and hear you. You'll also need access to a televideo platform. So um, I have access to a HIPAA compliant version of Zoom um, through a group that I work with. And that's what I use, um, but there are lots of different options out there. Um, and you should find one that kind of best suits your needs, but you will need something um, because in most areas you won't want to use something like FaceTime, for example. Um, you will still need, even though you're practicing remotely, um, an office or a private space to provide therapy. So just because a lot of us are working remotely doesn't mean that our confidentiality obligations and professional obligations kind of go out of the window. You've got to find a space um, where you can have control over minimize distractions for yourself and that other people, you know, that might be in the home with you if you're at home or in the office with you, if you're in an office somewhere, are not going to be hearing um, your therapy session. And as a part of this, um, you might consider using headphones, um, getting a white noise machine to block out sound. Um, sometimes headphones are even good, even um, when there is nobody else in the house, um, if you're at home, just because they deafen noise um, that might be kind of going on around you. You will still need access to your electronic medical record um, to secure document storage. I really do recommend if you can get access to a, a PDF editing app or something like that, um, where you can take documents and convert them into different forms, like take a PDF document and convert it into Word form. And I'll explain why about that later. Um, you'll also likely need some other contact information for your client and um, you need the right mindset. And we'll talk about that in a second. In terms of the basics of what your client needs, it's a lot of the same things that you need. The stable internet access, um, which can be a challenge in certain areas, but that's absolutely critical to doing uh, therapy via televideo. Uh, they also need the audio and video enabled device with microphone. They also need that private space um, to participate in therapy. And that's something that you really should problem solve on the front end before diving in. Um, and starting a session, you want to get these basics down. Where are they going to be when they do therapy? Um, what are the potential distractions in that space? Are they safe um, emotionally and physically to share if they participate in therapy in that space? Those sorts of things. Um, your client also really needs on that last bullet point, you to orient them to the technology and how to use it in therapy you're going to want to share some of the mindset lessons that we cover and um, actually take some time to adjust to a new modality that they probably have not used before for a doctor's appointment. Um, I included these major reminders. This was something I added since the last time I gave this talk, just because I've heard um, you know, lots of stories since then. And I think it's really important just to point out 
Um, so if you choose to use video, remember that your clients can see you, likely everything you do or everything you wear the whole time. Um, and you do not, you want to remember that you're on camera. Don't be doing things while you're on camera that you do not want someone to see. Um, seems like something that should go without saying. It's an adjustment and I've heard some stories. So remember that. Um, also remember that if you don't ask, um, something that's big, that's really different about televideo practice is if you don't ask, you might not know where your client is, who is in the room or the home with them. Um, and both of the above points are really important safety considerations, both again, emotionally and physically. So um, you want to ask uh, if when you start a session where the person is, make sure that you have a good address. Um, the reason for this is, you know, say a safety concern comes up and you need to call for a well check. You want to know where to send uh, the people doing the well check with who is in the room or the home. You're not going to be able to see on televideo um, the person's whole surrounding, whereas, you know, when someone's in your office, you can see that the door's shut and there's no one in there. Um, and so you will need to ask those questions. So my recommendation before getting started um, is to just pick one platform and get to know it really, really well. Um, I was joking earlier that uh, this uh, webinar software is something I'm kind of breaking my own rule on because I don't know how to use this as well. Before you do therapy, you want to know the ins and outs of whatever platform you pick. You know, video call your friends, your family, your neighbors, your colleagues. Um, practice, practice, practice with it. The reason for this is you need time to see things go wrong and to learn how to fix them. I've been doing, like I said, teletherapy for three years. I use Zoom for every session. Um, and every once in a while, the software still does something that I don't know why it's doing that. And I have to problem solve. But I was able to get a lot of that uncertainty out of the way early with a lot of practice. So spend the time, get some people on your team to just let you call them, experiment with your physical setup in that process, the camera angle, the background that you want to have, what's going to allow someone to see your facial expressions, things like that. Um, just make sure that your first, you know, sessions aren't going to be your first practice with the technology and that you've got it down before it's used in a professional setting. If you have access to IT support um, through your workplace, um, I also recommend just getting their number and keeping that on speed dial uh, so that you have it handy if you need help problem solving. Um, in terms of picking a platform, if you're new to this, I thought I'd just offer some pointers. Um, so the platform features I care about after doing this for a while, assuming that the security status is equal, um, is my number one by far is the ability to screen share. And I'll be able to show you why that is during this webinar, I'll do some demonstrations. Um, so I care a lot about whether I can screen share, meaning show the client on the other end what I'm looking at on my computer screen. Um, I also care that the platform is intuitive and easy to use. Um, not all my clients, very few of them are tech savvy. Um, so I want something that's pretty easy for them to navigate. And if I can get it, I love calendar integration, um, something that will actually put an appointment on my calendar for me. Um, but that one's less critical. Screen sharing by far is my top. So that's a feature to experiment with with different platforms. Uh, essentially, all of this practice and paying attention to features will help you be in a place where um, you're not going to become dysregulated if the technology doesn't work. At this point, you know, like every now and then, like I said, Zoom does something I don't get. It doesn't freak me out the way that it used to. Um, and I am able to handle it with the client very calmly, very professionally. And that's the place you want to be in too. And before that, that first session or at the beginning of that first session, you're going to have to plan for how you're going to kind of transfer that new knowledge you have of how to use this platform well to your clients. Um, depending on the age of your clients, uh, if they're small kids, you may be teaching a parent how to navigate the televideo platform. 
Um, if you've got older teens, you may be teaching them. Um, but you're going to need to do some sort of orientating to how to navigate the platform itself. Um, so you could consider having a formal orientation session of just like five, 10 minutes to go through it. Um, you can consider emailing or mailing instructions. And um, I would recommend also asking them to prepare or test just like you're doing. Um, I've seen, you know, physicians offices do this recently. You have a doctor's appointment and they say, you know, hop on do this test to make sure your internet connection is stable and they just give real simple instructions that you can click on uh, and test some things out. Same sort of thing. You wanna help the client feel like they know um, how to use the technology to do what they need to. Okay, so mindset is where I'm gonna spend a lot of uh, the rest of our time together because I think this is absolutely critical and possibly more critical um, because you know we we can learn how to use these features um, we also have to learn how to get into the right mindset about teletherapy for it to be effective so um, this slide I put together is just a little bit about like this is my mindset starting off like I said I did not like teletherapy when I first started doing it um, I think my thoughts centered around all the I can't and what teletherapy won't do um, I was thinking a lot of, I can't, you know, see my client's practice assignments. I can't hand them a box of tissues. I can't see their body language. I can't show them my body language. We can't work on worksheets together. I was focused on all those things that I perceived that I could no longer do anymore via the televideo. Um, I had a lot of thoughts about teletherapy won't. Um, it won't let me build rapport. It won't be as good as in-person therapy. It won't work for complex cases. Um, and you can imagine with all of that kind of running through your head, um, it's not going to set you up for a good experience. Um, what I've learned over time really is that um, this is all wrong. Uh, really, the only thing I have not been able to figure out how to do via televideo is uh, actually physically hand someone something. That is true. I can't solve the I can't hand you a box of tissues or hand you a toy. Um, you can't do that through a screen and that's totally true. Um, but that's all. I figured out ways of doing all of the other stuff and I actually have lots of good evidence that teletherapy is working for my clients just as well. Um, sometimes it's not better than in-person therapy. So we're gonna kind of switch mindsets here a bit. <laughs> so after a mindset shift, my tips for how to get into a better kind of mental space with this it, um, are outlined here and I'm gonna go through each one, one by one. Um, so I am gonna skip reading this right now and just go through individually. So my first tip on developing a mindset to be effective in teletherapy is to notice your frustrations and actually use them. So for example, if you are getting annoyed that you can't do something, use it as a sign that you need to figure out a way to meet that need, right? When we get frustrated um, because we can't do something we feel like we need to, chances are it's important. You know, embrace that, get creative, don't give up. Um, you know, move your mindset from I can't to asking yourself the question of how can I? Um, so a really simple example of this is, um, you know, in the therapy I do, I need to give lots of handouts and worksheets. So I might want to give someone um, a handout from DBT. Well, if I'm in my head saying I can't do it, <laughs> I guess I just don't give the worksheet anymore, right? That's really not helpful. Um, and it won't lend itself to good practice. So we need to switch mindsets, right? If I think through the lens of how can I, there are so many ways, actually, you can get handouts and worksheets to clients you are seeing via televideo. Um, you can use a screen share function, um, which I will demonstrate for you in a second. You can email it to the client. You can um, convert it to a Word document and possibly complete together via the screen share function. You can mail handouts. Um, you might have to be thoughtful about compiling them all ahead of time. But the reality is like you need to notice that frustration and decide how you're going to problem solve that you can't hand them a worksheet because to do the kinds of treatments that a lot of us do, we do need to give people 
either handouts or outcome measures, things like that. So if you get into this mindset of how am I going to do it, you will get creative and find a way. So a really simple example of what I mean um, when I say screen share, because I think not everyone is going to be familiar with this feature, I'm just going to kind of show you real quick. So screen share is just a function of a televideo platform, Zoom on Zoom, it says screen share. What I just did right now, I am screen sharing my slides with you while I'm giving this presentation. Now I'm screen sharing uh, one of the handouts that went out with this presentation, right? And I can pull it up on your screen to where now you're seeing um, the, the tip sheet that I sent out on tips on building rapport with youth via telehealth. This was put together by folks at UCLA. It's a wonderful resource. So I could do that same thing with a therapy worksheet, right? So now I've brought up on your screen an ABC sheet. And why I said a PDF um, application that converts PDFs to Word might be really helpful is because if I screen share a Word document, what I can also do is while I'm in session with a client, and I actually do this regularly, is we can complete it together where the person is either filling it out um, themselves kind of as we're talking and I'm mirroring that on the screen or um, with clients that have trouble writing sometimes like I they tell me what to type and I type it. So um, we can literally complete a ABC worksheet together on the screen. Um, so I have to do my first teletherapy session. A thought that I saw a lot is this won't work for my clients. And I feel frustrated. And there's a little bit of a lag in this screen share with this um, particular platform. Zoom really doesn't have a lag. Um, you can be filling out a sheet together with your clients via screen share. You can show them handouts and worksheets just like I showed you that tip sheet. Um, and you know, this is a much more helpful way of thinking about it is, well, we need to fill it out. Let's find a way to do it. Okay. Much more helpful mindset. Relatedly, you know, to noticing and using your frustrations, the concern about whether teletherapy works or not. Um, well, what I would say to this is to move from the thought, this won't work, to asking yourself, how can I know if this is working? So a lot of us use routine outcome monitoring, meaning we give our clients um, symptom measures each session. Um, you should keep doing that when you are seeing someone via televideo. So again, you can either mail them sheets, you can use uh, different survey uh, platforms like Google Forms. Uh, Qualtrics will give you a free account for a small number of items and you can build a survey um, that folks can fill out and you can screen share and show them their results. So this is just a snip from the way that I typically do this in my teletherapy sessions. I'll also demonstrate it real quick is um, I use uh, Microsoft Excel um, for a lot of this and I just have a regular old spreadsheet. I commonly give um, the PHQ-9, which is a measure of depression, and the PCL-5, which is a me measure of PTSD. Um, and I have a graph on another tab. And so at the start of each session, um, I'll have my folks, you know, read off to me what their answers were for the day. And they have a paper copy um, or a copy up on their computer or phone that they can see the choices. So as they read the answers to me, I put them into the spreadsheet. And we'll just do this for example, real quick. This seems like something that would be a, take a lot of time. Um, once your person gets used to doing it, this takes no more than five minutes in a session, usually a lot less, I would say two to three minutes to read these off real quick if your person's used to it. We get it entered in the spreadsheet and I can show them immediately how their symptoms this week compared to their symptoms last week with screen share. Um, I love this about doing uh, teletherapy because when someone's in my office, you know, I can't score them up quite as quickly or they have to like look over my shoulder to be able to see this Excel sheet. 
um, with screen share, I can show it to them just the way that I'm showing it to you now, um, right on their screen. They can see their scores and we can talk about it. Really neat tool. And so, you know, this graph that you're looking at right here um, might be an example of someone further along in therapy. They can see their progress every week and I can show them on the computer screen. So this serves the dual purpose of keeping your clients informed and being able to show them their progress as well as, you know, for your mindset, how do you know if it's working? Well, if you keep monitoring your client outcomes, you will see if it's working, if they're getting better. Um, and so, you know, this technique can be modified to whatever self-report measures, um, parent or child that you might typically use. My second kind of mindset tip is to learn the many helpful things that you can do. You know, like I said, when my mindset was starting off, it was focused on that I can't, I can't, I can't. Um, you do not have to be an expert from the beginning. It's important to give yourself permission for that. Um, you've got to give your, get the basics down first if this is new to, new to you. But do come back to this. You can do so many helpful things via televideo sessions that you cannot do um, as easily in session. So a couple of just simple examples. Um, it's a lot easier to do in session documentation. Um, you know, y'all can't see me right now. But um, with a lot of practice, I can maintain, you know, eye contact and be totally listening and keep a couple of notes in a Word document off to the side that my client, um, you know, isn't having to look at. They're not having to see me scroll notes on my paper while we're sitting, you know, as would happen if we were sitting in the room together. Um, but that helped me write my notes later. Um, and you'll have those process notes that you can actually look at later. Um, like I mentioned, you can share routine outcome monitoring scores easily. You can complete worksheets together um, in you know, full screen form. And um, even better, you automatically have a copy. You don't have to go to a copy machine um, if you're doing it that way. There are a lot of really helpful things you can do. You just have to have all that stuff pulled up before you start the session. So before I started this presentation, I said, OK, I want to show them the tip sheet. I want to show them how to track outcomes with uh, the Excel sheet and share those with the clients. I got all of that open so that when I decided I wanted to show you, just like if you wanted to show a client, it was a pretty seamless transition. I just told the computer to screen share that instead of my PowerPoint. So you can do a lot of helpful things. And I showed you that already, actually. My third mindset tip is to really focus on the positives and remind yourself of those, because there are some major pros um, to doing teletherapy. One is that you may actually get the chance to see your client in their, quote, real life, right, in their home environment. Um, you've got, you're gonna get a sense of that. Um, it, you know, it varies from client to client, but I've definitely had some folks that I've been seeing, you know, for a number of sessions, and they're really excited to show me their house because maybe they've been working on, um, you know, uh, changing things um, in their life, and they're able to show me some of that, or maybe they're just excited to, to actually build rapport in a different way, like, oh, here's my dog. <laughs> um, it can be helpful. Um, I haven't seen any data on this, but I also wonder if teletherapy presents a chance to learn skills in relevant contexts. So those of you that are trained behaviorally, you know, probably have heard of the principle, right? We need to teach people how to um, use their skills in all of the different kinds of contexts that they will use them in. And just because someone, you know, can do something in our office doesn't mean that they can do it in our home, in their life. Um, if you're doing teletherapy in the home, I, I wonder, and I would love to hear from anyone that might have seen data, um, anyone that's looked at this, if, if getting that practice in the home environment might actually be helpful. Um, some of the other positives, teletherapy is going to reduce some client burdens. So for example, transportation um, is a big barrier for a lot of our folks, and um, they don't have to worry about that with teletherapy can also be less uh, financially prohibited. Um, people aren't having to spend money on gas. They're not having to get a bus ticket. It also reduces the amount of time that somebody has to spend coming to session, um, coming from work, things like that. 
Um, it's important to note with this one, this tip with a caveat, like it's not a panacea. Teletherapy will not solve all barriers. So you do need to put your problem solving hat on. Um, if now wasn't the right time for therapy before teletherapy, the teletherapy is not going to fix that. Um, and, you know, we can't buy someone a stable internet connection. That's a real barrier. Like it's required to be able to do teletherapy. Um, and we might not be able to fix that, but we can try. We can help them brainstorm about, well, could they go somewhere else that, that does have a stable internet connection? Um, as things are starting to open back up, there may be options like, um, you know, a private room in a library, something like that. Another couple of pros of, you know, doing teletherapy right now, I think it's important to note that choosing to um, meet your clients needs in this way in the middle of the pandemic, um, something that you're doing is actually building a valuable um, long term skill. You know, even before COVID, telemedicine was rapidly expanding and it's going to continue expanding after um, after crisis is over. So you are building a skill that will be valuable to both you, your clients, but also possibly future employers. Um, as I mentioned, you know, another pro is some things are easier. Once you get the technology down, you can actually do some stuff more easily via televideo than you can in person. Um, and then another pro, this was something uh, that kind of was interesting to me when I started doing this. I wouldn't have anticipated um, this, but a lot of feedback that I got from a lot of my clients was that they actually really liked seeing someone that they're not going to run into at the grocery store. You know, I was seeing people that were pretty far away from me and they knew they weren't going to run into me in the community and they actually liked that. Um, so that's something worth thinking about too is, um, you know, some clients are uncomfortable with the teletherapy. Uh, I think, you know, the more that you can be an advocate, the more that you get cases that you've successfully completed and seen work, the more you can project that this is a good option for them. Um, I think I'm a lot better about, you know, remembering to encourage people now than I used to be before I'd seen it work for so many people. Um, but this is another advantage, even if they're not, you know, convinced by um, that. Okay. Um, tip number four, give everyone time to adjust. Um, so just, I, th I think something that can be a hang up as we're learning new skills is having really high expectations of ourselves and um, just getting frustrated that it's not perfect from the get go. So just remember to, to, to give yourself the thought that like, it doesn't have to be perfect. You're learning, your clients are gonna be learning um, and actually collaborating to solve the challenges of learning to use a new way for sessions um, for the first time can actually help you build rapport. Um, I use a lot of humor when technology goes wrong, like we laugh about it together. Um, and I, I mean, that feeds forward into, into building that relationship remotely. Um, because you're going to be adjusting, because it's not going to be perfect ever, and definitely not perfect from the start, there are some things you can do um, with that acknowledgement in mind. So I definitely recommend that you keep your clients or your clients parents phone number easily accessible during the session um, you do not want to you know have something go wrong with the technology and then you're scrambling to get into um, someone's chart you know you want to be able to access it if you need it and part of why this is important is of course because of um, you know technology failures that mean the session has to stop um, but part of it is because Phone is going to be a comfortable modality for a lot of people that can be moved to if frustrations are building up. So if technology has been repeatedly going wrong and you're just getting the sense that your client's checking out and getting frustrated and like just not having it anymore, or um, you know you have a kiddo that's in the room um, and has stopped completely paying attention to you and you need to get in touch with the parents because you're not able to engage them at all anymore. Um, you're going to want to have that phone number handy and just having it handy will bring down the anxiety about having to scramble when something goes wrong. So that's a big recommendation. Okay, moving right along. Um, tip number five, rolling with limitations. Um, this is just about making sure that your clients kind of get it about what it means to do teletherapy. You're going to need to say things out loud that you 
are not used to having to say. So, I mean, I think it's really important that like you just acknowledge the limitations are what they are and tell your clients them. Acknowledge anything that you truly cannot do or cannot see as well via televideo. So some examples, um, hygiene, it's, it is a lot harder to tell if somebody is um, having trouble with hygiene practices. It's a lot harder to tell if someone is uh, losing or gaining weight, depending upon the clothes that they wear. Um, it can be hard to see facial expressions um, or body language. And I put the or in big letters because it's kind of like, um, you have to pick which one you want more, <laughs> right? Because you either have a camera that zoomed in on someone's face and you can see their facial expressions, you know, really well. And you ask them to hold the camera up close or sit up close so you can see those facial expressions. Um, or they're going to be further away from the camera where you can see their body language, but you can't see their face. Um, I recommend trying to get a good view of the face. Um, but I also recommend just talking about it with your folks, right? Like you need to say, you know, I'm not going to be able to see, you know, your emotions as well as I can when we're sitting in the office together. And so you're going to have to tell me maybe if you're getting upset. Um, just pointing out that, you know, it's very likely not that I'm trying to ignore you or not acknowledge it if you're feeling an emotion and I'm not responding to it. Like, I truly can't see you as well via the camera. And um, it's important to acknowledge, like, this is good practice anyway. We want our folks to be able to tell us how they feel, um, to acknowledge their needs. And so if you explicitly talk about these things, what you can't do as well or see as well, um, you give people a chance to kind of have a voice with this. Um, the other thing to just tell people, like you can't see who's in the room. We, I acknowledge this early in the slides that this is important for you to keep in your mind, but you also need to tell the client that um, because they may not realize um, that you can't tell. Um, this was not during a therapy session. This was during uh, a meeting I was having with a student actually. Um, you know, we were talking, 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 and then all of a sudden a little face pops up from the side. <laughs> and she's like, oh, this is my cousin. <laughs> um, and I, you know, in that context, it didn't matter. We were just, you know, having a chat about, you know, how things were going for her in the midst of the pandemic, um, checking in kind of thing. But you can see that happening if you don't remember to ask in a teletherapy session. Like, you can only see the view of who's in the camera. Um, so the language that I often use is I, I'll say, you know, are, you know, is the door shut now? Are we alone? And ask those two things. Um, anything that you're worried about asking, you can consider, you know, depending on the age of your client. I think I have this tip later in the slides. You could ask that question via the chat function um, on a lot of video platforms. So if you are concerned that there may be someone in the room, and the client is not acknowledging that, you could potentially type it in the chat function. Um, if you're working with someone that you're concerned about um, in-home violence, you know, trying to make sure that during that orientation session, you talk about, you know, what, is, is there gonna be a signal that um, isn't obvious that someone has come into the room that you, you know, you and I can agree upon that if I see you do this, or if I hear you say this word, <laughs> that we're gonna stop talking. Um, just planning ahead for those kinds of concerns uh, is a good idea. So you need to talk through all this, roll with the limitations, and problem solve together. Um, I think the short version of everything I just said is usually the solution is to make sure you're talking about these things out loud, and it's okay to acknowledge. You normally don't have to, but for this we do. So I gave a lot of examples of these things as um, as I was talking through the examples, but just to give you an idea like, you know, limitation, you don't know where someone is. You need to explicitly communicate this. Explicitly say like, every time we start, I'm gonna ask you where you are. Um, and if I don't have the address, if you say home, I'm gonna get that address. Um, we talked about developing signals. We talked about uh, making sure that the door is shut and explicitly asking that and asking if anyone's in the room. Um, limitation, not being able to use your five senses as well, like with clients that um, are depressed or have eating disorders, um, I've just talked with them about like, you're gonna have to kind of tell me <laughs> if you're struggling with hygiene, because I'm not gonna be able to see it as well. Um, or, you know, with someone with an eating disorder, um, I found that via televideo, I really couldn't tell um, 
what the the weight status was the same way in person and so i needed them to tell me how that was going and we would have talked about these things anyway it's just reminding yourself that um it may not come as natural you know um, people mentioned you know not being able to supply toys for a therapy engagement in the survey or um, just not having access to those materials that are in the office you know possible solutions are to coordinate with parents about just seeing what's available in the home um, providing items if you can afford to that are inexpensive or thinking about items that are inexpensive um, you know print out paper dolls might be you know something that could work better than uh, actual toys um, so just get your problem solving hat on and try to roll with the limitations and remember to to solve what you need so you know the summary here really is to think conceptually about what you need to do and to find a way to meet that need just a quick point on this um, tip number six once you have your bearings you know you can develop a detailed orientation script and use it literally type it up in a word doc you can easily keep this in front of you when you're on televideo if you're on a computer so that you have reminders to yourself um, and these are some points that i personally would keep in my orientation script um, of course things around remote consent acknowledging the modality um, but also, I always try to remember to share positivity about the technology. Like, if you've seen it work well, say so. Now I say that to my folks, like, I know it feels a little weird at first. This has worked really well for, um, you know, almost all of my clients that have used it. And I'm excited to, to do teletherapy with you and just communicate that positivity. Um, and then come up with plans. What's going to be the plan if you get disconnected? Make sure you talk about that with them. Just do all of these things in an orientation session so you know you're covered. And uh, this includes coordinating with caregivers as needed. You know, you may need to check in. You may need them to check in frequently or even be available in the room the whole time, depending upon um, the child's uh, needs and age and things like that. Um, you'll also need to discuss advantages, disadvantages, and needs. We talked about that quite a bit. I think the last point I want to make here is to talk openly with the client about how to manage distractions um, and to think internally about how you're going to manage distractions. This is just as relevant in teletherapy as it is live. Um, so, you know, for me mentally to be able to completely focus, I'm going to have to close my email gonna have to silence my phone and sometimes uh, and I actually did this before this presentation I actually literally restart my computer to force myself to close everything because I am just as guilty as the next person of having a whole bunch of tabs open um, and it just is a nice mindset shift to just say like all of that is done now I'm here to focus on my therapy session I don't need all this open um, and I get it all closed um, and you are gonna want to recommend that your clients do similar things um definitely you know not being doing multitasking um turning off other things and you know use whatever else helps you both be completely present um headphones standing up moving around um anything and just talk through that and then one last kind of quick tip um as far as mindset <laughs> so technology failures are frustrating um, mindset wise just learn the value of a simple reboot basically if something stops working close it out and restart it this could be the platform your computer whatever it is um, i've learned this after many an it call honestly if even if you have access to it the first thing they're going to ask you to do is to restart your computer <laughs> restart the program if it's not working just go ahead and do it i've been amazed at how many times for some reason just closing out you know, and going back into something seems to fix the problem. So learn just to embrace that, do it early, try it. It solves a lot of the problems a lot of the time. Okay, so just, um, those are like the main mindset tips that I have. I have a couple of slides just on smaller tips or practical advice that I'm gonna kind of breeze through here really quick. Um, Client engagement, this was something that people asked for a bunch. 
Um, you have a whole tip sheet, one for adults and one for children, uh, that was developed not by me, by folks at UCLA, but those tip sheets are so helpful. Please read them. Some quick points. Um, you know, making eye contact via televideo is just as important as in um, in person therapy. Reminder that if you're trying to make eye contact, actually, you know, I can't demonstrate this because you can't see me, but if I wanted to make what appears to be eye contact with you, I have to look into the camera, not at my screen. And so in teletherapy, you need to do some level of balancing between looking at the screen where you can see your client's facial expressions and remembering to look up at the camera so that they see, you know, signals that appear like you're making eye contact. Um, also, you know, use a camera position that allows clients to see your facial expressions. You can experiment with this ahead of time. Um, a lot of folks, and I feel like I have to do this too, is like intentionally use more animated facial expressions and gestures, and it'll start coming natural. You know, if you're going to smile, <laughs> like you can see what that smile looks like on the screen. You might have to smile a little bigger um, for it to show on a screen. So just remember that. Um, remember to use the technology. Um, with kiddos and with adults, you can do some pretty cool things. Like I said, pull them up in advance, but you could pull up and show videos on YouTube. You could pull up and show them websites that have coping skills. You can use online games to aid in teletherapy. Um, you can use the whiteboard function or paint. Um, you can do activities on the screen together if they have a computer. Um, all of that is possible with that screen share feature I mentioned. Um, that is why it is my number one thing, because it gives you so much flexibility in the types of things you can do during a session. Um, with the whiteboard function or paint, I'm just going to show that um, quickly as well. So um, what I mean by that, so Zoom has a whiteboard function that you can use. I often literally just use Microsoft Paint, um, and I can use it just like a uh, whiteboard. So if I want to say, draw something and illustrate stress levels. So this is my poor computer drawing of two cups. And I'm gonna show people about how we all have some kind of inherent level of stuff in our kind of emotional cup taking up space due to biology. And I'm just doing this super quick but maybe i'll kind of demonstrate that you know for person a they have that much stuff in their cup person b has a little less and i'm going to keep illustrating you know this concept by drawing different layers of different you know stressors that we all might have um, taking up emotional space because i want to talk to them about kind of stress management this is just one example of you know this is a free tool on um, most everybody's computer that you can use just really quickly as a quick whiteboard, just like in the room. Zoom has an integrated one that's a little bit prettier. Um, you can use whatever platform you'd like. And my slides went back a little bit when I exited out, so I'm just moving forward. Um, so use those tools, use that screen share, Basically, um, do what you normally do. Find a way to do what you normally do. Tips for kids. Otherwise, um, make sure you're discussing privacy issues as appropriate. I mentioned you know, how you can manage safety in the home, considering using chat functions with older kids. Remember that just as you can use screen share, if you've got an older kid, you can teach them how to use that feature so that they can show you things too. Um, you can give them the ability to control the screen and show you things. Um, if you've got a kid that's not that old, they can still, I mean, the camera works both ways, right? They, they could hold up a drawing that they made to express themselves. Um, they could show you a piece of music that they might normally play for you on their phone. Um, you might ask them, you know, to show you a favorite toy, that sort of thing. Um, they can, you can use that camera and um, help them, help them share with you. You'll probably want to seek more verbal confirmations, just that they've heard you and um, that uh, they understood. You can use tools in Zoom like virtual high fives and thumbs up. There are little icons you can press to get that to kind of show on the screen. 
Um, so use those signals as well that you know you're listening and um, connecting with them. Um, you do probably want to avoid noisy toys if you are going to involve uh, toys in the session just because sound is a little bit harder remotely. So um, yeah, just mentioning to really read those tip sheets that went out with the webinar. They have tons of great pointers. All right, wrapping up here. Um, we're all, a lot of us are reacting, you know, to the pandemic right now, scrambling to transition quickly to televideo. Just a note that if you are gonna continue doing this long-term, I really think that you have to have, you know, infrastructure to do it. Um, I view, and I've told several clinic managers that have talked about, you know, integrating this, um, this as well, like, Clinicians really do need two computer screens to do their best work long term, where they can both have one screen where they've got all their materials that they can screen share, and then another screen where they're going to keep, you know, the the video feed to see the client um, on a different screen. It just allows you to organize easier and make sure that you don't end up screen sharing things you don't mean to. Um, you also need to build infrastructure over time getting your therapy sheets to be possible to edit, you know, in that Word document form so you can complete them together is another way you can build infrastructure, getting comfortable drawing with paint or with Zoom whiteboard like I am now, just kind of comes with practice. Okay, one little quick tip, if you supervise students um, and they are doing teletherapy, um, something you can do is have your trainees invite you to their web sessions when they send out the web invite. This just makes sure that you can always jump on in case of a quick, you know, in case of an urgency or emergency. So long as you have that link to the session, you just open it up and you join the session. All right, last note uh, on taking care of yourself. Um, with teletherapy, something really important is just that like the little things matter. Um, you need to remember more than you normally do to move and stand up. Normally in our day, you know, we might be walking to get clients. We might um, be walking somewhere for lunch. It's so easy that if you're booked with a bunch of teletherapy sessions to forget to move. Um, you also need to remember to make intentional plans to connect with colleagues because this might not be built into your day in the same way. Um, that it was when you were in an office, say, seeing people in person. Um, I tell people to seriously consider documenting during session. It is one big advantage of teletherapy is to be able to um, document in the middle of the session in a way that's a little bit less awkward than in person. Um, our time is always tight. We don't get a lot of time for documentation and it's gonna be especially tight when you're trying to learn a new way of working. So if you can pull up a Word document and be typing a couple notes or even finishing your note while you're in the session, um, that is a good use of time. Um, and then just remember to take advantage of working remotely. Um, it can be stressful. Um, so remember you can do things that you um, can't do when you're in the office. So. There might be some small advantages. I noted a couple that I see as advantages for me personally in my stress management, so choose yours. So um, I'm gonna pause here and we just have a couple minutes. Um, if there is a major uh, question that anybody has, um, Chad, I don't know if you're able to see those. Yeah, um, so uh, a couple have rolled in. If you could just advance to the next slide so I can just tell folks about the, yep. Um, so I'll just kind of talk about the CU. Um, so I'm going to send out a uh, email following this webinar, and um, there will be a link to enter this code. So today's code is 1405, and um, just be sure to enter that if you're interested in um, getting a CU. So um, today's code is 1405. Um, and so a couple of questions did come through. Uh, one person asked, do you find it takes um, longer to build rapport? Or maybe how is that different televideo versus in a traditional office setting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, you know, for me, I, I don't think so. I don't think that I've seen a systematic difference in how long it's taken to build rapport um, in person versus virtually. Um, I would say it's more variable just with the person as it always is. So um, 
Yeah, I guess, I guess, no, I, I also pay attention to it, I guess is my thing. So I gave some tips on uh, virtual engagement, on how to make eye contact, on still being animated, on doing things that can kind of provide some variability in session. And I think that's mattered. I think probably when I was first doing teletherapy, <laughs> um, maybe then it probably was taking longer for me to build rapport just because I was probably communicating also some discomfort with like navigating it. Um, so I guess my answer is with practice. I actually think you can build a lot of rapport. Um, and similarly to in person. Okay. Um, and then uh, something we a couple of people have asked is uh, to how do we get a copy of um, your slides? And so also following this webinar, um, we're actually going to have a survey that'll be given out. And once you complete the survey, um, you'll be able to download slides and some of the handouts, etc. So um, just be looking for an email that's going to be following this webinar, and you'll be able to. Um, download these slides if you are able if you're able to um, complete that survey so um, and then I lastly um, well this might kind of wrap it up here but um, is, is, are there any um, resources Dr. Zelensky that you can kind of direct people towards you know kind of making a decision on what platform is best for me or for my office do you have any kind of mm -hmm. thoughts on that Oh, that's a hard question because I feel like so much of it comes from practice. Yeah. Um, I'm not aware of like, if you Google like decision tool online platform, you might be able to find something that someone's put together that outlines kind of pros and cons of the different platforms for therapy. I, I guess my, my recommendation though is that you actually try them out. Most programs have a free version mm -hmm. that you can download and experiment with. So I would say go ahead and download the ones that you're considering and try them out and see um, see which one best meets your needs through that practice and through practicing calling you know family and friends before you really start with clients yeah that's a great suggestion and something that um, i know we've done too you usually have like a demo for you know a week or two weeks and um, definitely take advantage of that so yes yep okay well and um, if you want to back out to your uh, email address i think you had that on this slide? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if if there was a question um, that you know you wanted to ask but we didn't um, get to answer it, um, you can email Dr. Zelinsky here. Uh, you also have a copy of my email. So thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Zelinsky, for today's presentation. You're welcome. Thank you for everyone who joined. I hope this was helpful. Okay. All right, well, we will um, end today's webinar, so hopefully we'll see you next month.